This is Spencer of the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Dave LaMatina and Carol Spinney from the documentary I Am Big Bird, The Carol Spinney Story, um, which, as the title <laughs> should clearly illustrate, is the story behind the man, Carol Spinney, who is the spirit of Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch. Uh, I want to start, start by talking about the origins of this project. I mean, obviously there's an intriguing story to be told, but what made you decide to tell this, Dave, and Carol, what made you agree to let Dave tell your story? Yeah, uh, well, I guess the the first thing I should say is that we work, it, well, there's three of us that are on this project. It's uh, myself, Chad Walker, who I direct with, and our executive producer, Clay Frost. And honestly, I had no idea who Carol was, and I had interned at Sesame Workshop. Uh, it was one of my first jobs in the industry. I was telling one of my friends about it, and she said, oh, I'm actually related to Carol Spinney. I said, I, I don't know who that is. And so she said, oh, he's Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch and has been since 1969, and he's still doing it. So I told Chad and Clay, and uh, we said, wow, this, is, this could really be a great movie. And this is back in 2009. Um, and at that point, thinking that there's no way Sesame Workshop is ever going to agree to it, uh, we sent some emails to some people I used to work with, and they, they got back to us within like 24 hours and said, we love this idea. Why don't you come on in and meet Carol and Deb? So we went in and had a chance to sit down and, and speak with Carol and his lovely wife, Deb. And if you've seen the movie or if you get a chance to see the movie, you'll understand that we can't really mention Carol without mentioning Deb. Um, and so we sat there, we spoke in a room with him for a little while, and then I guess I can let you answer uh, why you said yes. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I was. we were immediately intrigued, the idea that anybody would bother making a movie about me because i not one to allow myself to be very impressed with me. <laughs> it's just my nature, I guess. But uh, anyway, but it seemed intriguing. And so we drove down to New York. We don't live in New York. And uh, uh, as soon as we met the two gen young gentlemen, uh, we were more than intrigued because they presented themselves very well and their ideas about it. And uh, it was also being encouraged by Sesame Street PR department themselves. And uh, I said, gee, it sounds... I think we should go ahead with it. And uh, Deb then mentioned that she had, we had quite an archive, because I've been taking movies since 1954 while I was in the Air Force. And uh, and then when, in, when we finally got a uh, videotape machine in uh, about 1978, we started taking a lot of video, and Debbie took over being the camera person. And uh, she was terrific. So we had uh, reams of stuff for them to look through. Yeah. No, it, it all began. I mean, it's, it, you, you, I mean, you talk about the archive, and it's a pretty incredible treasure trove that you kind of stumbled upon here. The closest thing I've actually been able to come up with in terms of thinking about your career is, um, have you ever heard of David Jones? He was supposedly like the inspiration for Steve McQueen's character in The Great Escape, but he was like a guy who was in, involved with the Doolittle Raids, and he was involved in a, a prison camp, and he was working for NASA and all these different things. And it actually sort of reminded me of that because, you know, you're talking about, you know, going to China after Nixon brokered that deal, you know, the Challenger um, situation, all these different things. When you finally discovered this, like, history, what was it like trying to actually put together this movie? Because it felt like it could have been, like, a mini series with all these different stories. Yeah, I mean, we often talk about all the things we cut out. And actually, just last night, we were sitting around talking about a few things that, like, we had forgotten. There's this picture of Carol with the young JFK because Carol is shooting his <laughs> campaign ad. And it's, like, it's insane. Like, it, there's just so much stuff like that. And it's really hard to figure out... Um, how to make it so it's not a miniseries and it, and it is a, hopefully a, a, a tight 90 minutes. Um, and what we, what we ended up doing is looking at uh, not just how cool these events are or, or you know, uh, how dramatic they are, but how those events shaped Carol and, and how he reacted to those events. And because those are, in those moments, um, and how you react is, we think, uh, what makes Big Bird who Big Bird is. And so you see those moments that shape Carol and you see they shape how he portrays Big Bird, if that makes that was kind of rambling. But it, but I mean yeah, I mean this archive was was just astounding. And it's still it still amazes me when we go back through and see these pictures of whether it's in China, um like Carol's related to to Barack Obama, which is insane and doesn't make it into the movie. Right? So it's like <laughs> it, it, there's just 
<laughs> endless amounts of things that could have gone. In. Uh, I always say that he's like, uh, like he's Forrest Gump. You know, he's always yeah, that's there. Cool. That's another yeah. great. Yeah. Life is like a chocolate. <laughs> um, for you, Carol. I mean, obviously, you know, this is your story, but it's also Big Bird story in a lot of way. What was it like for you in terms of like? wanting that story told because you're clearly very proud of what Big Bird is, proud of who he's become, proud of what he represents in culture. How did you exactly sort of like watch as he was helping to craft this story around someone who you've described as essentially like a child to you? Yes, well, I it took me for a while a while to identify with him more than I did at start. As a matter of fact, it's a little shuddering for me to watch the early parts of the film because Big Bird looked so terrible yeah. <laughs> in the beginning of the thing. He, he was, uh, uh, Jim Henson had so many brilliant ideas, a real genius. But on this one, I, I didn't really agree as soon as we got into the show that he should be a really silly, goofy guy. He said, think of Mickey Mouse's pal Goofy. And so... Uh, that's why at first he said, oh, here I am, a big bird. <laughs> and uh, sounded a little bit like a dinosaur. But uh, anyway, he uh, gradually, as we were doing the first year of the show, I thought that he really should be a kid rather than a, just a big eight-foot-two goofy guy hanging around the kids. And uh, it's hard to motivate that. So I, I said, I'm going from now on, I'm going to, ease him into a, being a child, and I, I lightened the voice from, hi there, a big bird, to, hi there, I'm big bird. And uh, he kind of gradually moved that way within a couple weeks of the show. And um, also, uh, when Big Bird was first seen, the feathers were, they had never really worked with feathers before, and they were put on very haphazardly, and he looked very raggedy. And look, and, but he had almost no feathers above his eyes, the first few shows. Within the week, there were more feathers appearing on the top of his head, making room for a, appearance. Maybe there was room for a bit of a brain there. And uh, I think he quite progressed into the child that we now all know. And uh, the thing that really started to impress me was how many people would have similar stories, like how much Big Bird meant to them. And the first thing that reached me on that were the letters I would get. They, so many of them said, Dear Big Bird, you're my friend. And, uh, and some of them were quite funny, like, uh, Why don't you come play with me? How about next Thursday? <laughs> Another one is, uh, uh, I just got a double bunk. You can have the top. Please come. You know, and stuff like that. So children started identifying with him because, not because of the way he looked, but because, but of the heart and of that child that seemed to come out of that funny looking bird. And he got to be much better looking. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I look a lot better when I'm in my feathers. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's definitely interesting to sort of see the evolution of it. And you're, you're right. I mean, I think you've hit upon the, the point exactly. And it was funny because I was thinking about, you know, being Elmo. Now they talk about, you know, Elmo. You talk about Elmo's sort of rise within this the spectrum of Sesame Street. But there's an element of Big Bird to me that is almost like a time capsule. And I think it really sort of shows when you got introduced to Sesame Street and how you relate to the character. Because, for instance, like you're talking about, you talk about was a Big Bird in China. Uh, like, I had never even heard of that movie. Uh. But while watching this movie, the first thing that occurred to me was follow that bird. I can't tell you how many times I watched that movie on VHS when I was a kid because that was, like, what I grew up with. What is this sort of like when you're talking to these people about Carol and they're telling these stories like stories from different times. I mean, his kids, people who worked with him. It's, it's. I mean, it's, it's like a time capsule in some ways. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's, it's been really cool because we had the experience of making the film, where we'd go through these archives and we'd look at something, and you know, whether it's a skit or it's you know, um, even just hearing the way Big Bird sleeps. You know that that like sort of snore that you do. Um, there are these. <laughs> Whoops, sorry, I had to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> there are these moments that, um, yeah, I mean, you, you say a time capsule. It, like, emotionally, I, I compared it to someone yesterday, to that moment in Ratatouille when he tastes the Ratatouille and he just goes, like, right back to his childhood. That's mm -hmm. exactly what it's like. That's the best way I can describe it. It just gives you this emotional connection that you completely forgot that you have. 
Um, and I think that's why people are reacting so strongly to the movie. And, you know, we've gotten to see now firsthand people come up to Carol and tell him um, whatever that moment is for them that, that made it happen. Like for you, it was, it was follow that bird. Um, and it's just awesome. Like it's just so cool and it's so awesome to be a part of that. It's, I don't know, it's, it's a great honor, honestly. It's almost like a language in and of itself where people like, I mean, they might not all understand each other, but they can relate on some yeah. capacity of something. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that everyone, you know, we always sort of said in the beginning of this project, oh, like you think you've outgrown Big Bird, you haven't, you know, like you really haven't outgrown Big Bird. Um, you know, might not sit down and watch a show for hours, but our hope is that at some point in the movie, as we, as we take him through chronologically, you'll connect with that moment and, and you'll figure out what that is for you. For you, Carol, what is it like to actually sit back and sort of revisit these memories? Because there's so there's so many things. Like even thinking about just my life, I can't remember like huge swaths of time, and I didn't I didn't have these grand sort of adventures. But for you, like there's a lot of amazing stories being told. What was it like to sort of sit back and actually get to revisit all these memories? Well, uh, it's sort of it's quite an experience to sit in the theater and see yourself up on a big screen because I, I made the, the the one movie I've been Big Bird was in a lot of Muppet movies just as a cameo an Oscar would do you know like a, a two minute thing in the movie uh, but uh, seeing it all come back it's sort of like having your part of your life played back to you and things and the details I remember uh, well uh, only because I've seen the film because some things I said I didn't know it looked like that when I did it, you know. And uh, but it's it's quite a neat experience seeing your uh, life b being uh, play portrayed in the, on the screen, and having people hearing people in the theater react to it too. Because there's even uh, it, one of the interviewers at one of the places where we premiered the show was uh, she brought a box of Kleenex with her, and she was using it during the movie. <laughs> I suspect a lot of people probably. I mean, I definitely teared up a few times. There's some pretty amazing moments, particularly the reunion towards the end where it's just these profound, just not even like big bird moments, just like personal human moments. That Yes, and a big like, bird, I think, is uh, the scripts, of course, should never be uh, forgotten and not appreciated because, uh, for Sesame Street because the writers really have come up with wonderful stories and things that, that always have... Very cleverly in it, there's a me there's a lesson in there, but it doesn't ram down your throat. It's sometimes quite subtle, but the children grow from it, from the stories, both emotionally and uh, in the. Sometimes there's uh, counting things involved with a cute bit, but by doing those th shows that way, we've gotten across what they hope to do, to start with, which was that the. Uh, the, the whole goal of the show to start with was that we would uh, help children who weren't getting it at home uh, the information to show they'd be more prepared for school. And now it's reached the point where uh, some schools won't let a child in the, their kindergarten if he hasn't watched at least a year or so <laughs> of Sesame Street. So we we've become part of the curriculum. And in spite of all the criticism we had to begin with, there was tremendous amount of criticism in the first year. They were trying too hard. They were showing children couldn't learn that quickly. And uh, we proved that, because uh, people was, have had 21-month-old uh, children, and one little boy says, look, they, a billboard with, as they drove by, look, Daddy, letter B. You know, he wasn't even two yet. <laughs> and uh, they, were, I, they didn't even mention the alphabet when I went to kindergarten. That was the first grade thing. They, they, so it taught a lot of people that you could teach children in a different manner. So Joan Gans Cooney managed to uh, see that the people she gathered to around her were able to accomplish what she was hoping for. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's a pretty amazing thing to think about how powerful its impact is on culture. I want to talk about briefly Jim Henson. Um, I mean, there, it's amazing sort of hearing your story about meeting him and how he sort of like, he could see even though your uh, your play that night in Salt Lake City didn't go so well, but he was able to it see like the potential there. <laughs> was it like working with him? And what did you actually sort of learn from that experience? Well, I, I had first met him 
uh, when I first saw him in 1960 uh, on television, it was like eight second commercials. And uh, it, uh, the first one I saw was a, a little guy, looked a little bit like Kermit the Frog, and he had a little tiny cannon. And it was facing that way. And the guy pops up, he says, uh, and the little guy with the cannon says, do you, do you drink um, Wilkins coffee? No, says the other guy. Boom, he blows it right off the stage. The cannon <laughs> made a big boom sound, and, and actually talcum powder is how they made the explosion. Blown by somebody blowing in a tube. And, 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 he, and he says, then he turns the cannon to the camera and says, how about you, do you drink Wilkins coffee? And uh, I said, now that's a puppet show. That was the best puppets I'd ever seen. And it was like, that's the way they should be done. And I got to meet him briefly in 1962. And uh, he liked what he saw me do a little bit of a show. And he, he said, why don't you come down to New York and talk about the Muppets? I thought he was just uh, uh, inviting me to chat. But I didn't have much money. I was making like $28 a week being on television. And uh, so I didn't meet him again until 69 when I had made a very elaborate show. And it turns out he was going to be in the audience. I didn't know he was scouting for someone to play two characters he was going to make for Sesame Street, a grouch and a bird. And my show went all bad, as you know if you've seen it. Uh, and he uh, he said, I liked what you're trying to do. And then he, he uh, said, why don't you come to New York and talk about the Muppets? And I, I said, deja vu, I think. <laughs> and I said, so what, what do you mean? Because I... Uh, I thought he meant, but if, since he said the same thing, he says, well, you know, working working with me, not for me, but with me. Well, the idea of working with Jim Henson, the ultimate puppeteer for my mind, uh, was a most awesome thing. What an invitation. I said, I'll be there. When do you want me to get there? We were in Salt Lake City at the time at a puppet festival. And so a few weeks later, I drove down to New York and met with him. And... Uh, came to the conclusion that I would take the job even in spite of the fact it didn't pay a lot but I, I took a big pay cut to take the job I'm very glad I did sometimes you have to do that I think with all the material that you had at your disposal Dave how did you actually end up going about selecting what would be in the, the film because it could have been like as I said a mini series there's like eight different films that could have been told how did you end up selecting this one as the final one yeah well I'll say that we took every piece of footage they gave us and I transcribed everything and then Chad logged everything um, and Chad uh, in addition to directing with me uh, is the editor and he has this wonderful eye for um, capturing and, and capturing the feelings of the pieces and uh, of pieces that Carol and Deb gave us and repurposing them to, to sort of drive a scene. Um, and so it, he would just, I don't, I don't know, but there's something about people filming themselves when they don't think anyone else is ever going to see it. I mean, it's just so intimate. It's so personal. And then Carol and Deb would do things like they would be sitting here, they would set the camera up on a tripod and they would hold hands and walk over it and clear the frame. So we had like all these wonderful edits already built in. Um, and and so Chad would just find things that, that work for the scene and, and capture the emotion that we were trying to, you know, to portray in the film. And he did, he did a beautiful job with it. Yeah, I think he did. I, I could not have, never have done that. I don't think I'd be that great an editor. But particularly, <laughs> it, it, it's so connected to the bits that uh, a lot of them like are deja vu. Oh, she had forgotten that. Uh, but, uh, but to select them, I, I would boggle my mind. How do we end up with that? much or that little yeah compared to the thousand hours of material you had to yeah i mean and they would they would do things like you know especially when they moved over to video they would let the camera run as they drove through the countryside of new zealand you got, or whatever they seen a lot of new zealand for like six <laughs> hours and they're just like not even talking just listening to music as they look out the window it's like a richard link later yeah it's so <laughs> <laughs> it was so it was a lot of that um but we always on every single tape there was something right so there's one of my favorite moments is there's just the camera is sitting on a tripod or deb is holding it somewhere in like a train station in germany and I'm like, why am I watching all of these people walk through the German train station? And then all of a sudden, through the crowd in the distance, Carol comes skipping through the crowd and then makes the movie. And it's just one of these moments that captures who he is. And so we just looked for those moments that that's, you know, showed the man. 
the big question, though, for both of you is, you know, Oscar is seen in the movie, but when's his movie coming out? I even got an idea for a title. I'm here to a grouchumentary. When is that movie? Because I want to see you write that I like, down. I like that. That was pretty good. Write yeah, that, that was down. good. Uh, Oscar is so fun, and it's actually, you know, it's uh, unfortunately not practical to take Big Bird out in the festival circuit with us. Um, the good part about that is that we can take Oscar everywhere. And he fits Oscar in the overhead bin. No charge. It's so funny. And Oscar, when he's when Carol is, is improvising with Oscar, or it's just hilarious. And it's so fun. I'm really excited that audiences get to see that because Carol has a wicked sense of humor. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I am Big Bird. It's playing here at SIF 2014. What's next for it? Where can people see it? And website or anywhere that'll update people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we are in the process of uh, the film festival circuit, and uh, we've gotten lots of int- uh, interest from distributors. And I said that in a weird way. We've gotten lots of interest from distributors, and the the hope and the plan is to have a, a theatrical run, and then follow it up with you know sort of being available everywhere. Um, the best way to keep track of all that is, of course, on our website, which is just iambigbird.com, uh, or on our Twitter is copper underscore pot but really i am bigbird.com has everything yeah I, even even uh, a lot of people got very excited about it because uh we we'd tell them they said where can we see this well just google i am big bird and uh and they got to see you did so, a couple of about 20 minutes of stuff you know yeah. that some of it's in the movie and and or hint of what the movie's going to be like uh but uh, there's a lot of stuff in this if you ever need to do any more follow-up stuff You've got plenty of material. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I can't imagine Googling Big Bird. There's probably like 20 billion pages. There were a lot more. There were a lot of hits, especially in the during the uh, election. So that uh, that, oh, was, yeah. that, that was that was fun. Part of the yes. as well. And uh, I remember uh, we looked up uh, Google one time uh, Big Bird, and uh, even though it included some ostriches and emus, <laughs> um, there were a hundred. Was it uh, one million eight hundred thousand pictures? Holy still cow. pictures of uh, Big Bird oh. and those other kinds of birds as well. Wow. Wow. Thank you guys so much for joining me, Dave, Carol. I wish you you the best of luck with the film, and I can't wait to see uh, it get out to the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us on.